Today, we're in the small and sleepy village of Metamora, Ohio, home to 20-year-old Sierra Jargon, a student at the University of Toledo Junior College of Business. Sierra's family said she was hard to miss, always very loud, full of energy, and loved to perform and entertain. She was the first born and was followed by two brothers and two sisters, and was especially close to her mother Sheila. Her mother said there was never a dull or quiet moment, and she was happy to make herself the butt of the joke to make everyone smile. She didn't ever take things too seriously, and friends joked that even as a teenager, she would do things like dance around the school in their cheerleading uniform, even though she wasn't on the team, just to get a laugh. And it was in high school, aged just 13, where she met Josh Kolosinski. It was a case of young love and first love, but flash forward seven years later, they were still together, stronger than ever, and were now talking about marriage after college. They shared the same love of sports, the outdoors, and loved travelling together. Josh joked that he didn't win many arguments. Sierra had a very strong personality, was fiercely independent and confident, and if she wanted to do something, it was pointless telling her no. Her aunt Tara said, She had a way of making everybody feel comfortable. Even a person who's an introvert and shy, she'd bring that person out. You could take her anywhere and know she was going to make a friend. July 19th, 2016, 6.30pm. With all the winding country roads and lovely views, Metamora was the perfect place for Sierra and Josh to go on long walks and bike rides. Sheila had wanted her daughter to stay in that day and talk about plans for after college, but Sierra had just got a new purple bike, and with the lovely summer weather like this, she didn't want to sit inside. Sierra and Josh spent the afternoon together at his house, but it was now time for Sierra to head back. Josh took his motorcycle and Sierra was on her new bike. Josh filmed two videos of them and uploaded both to Snapchat at 6.43pm. It was about a seven mile ride back to her mother's, and with just a couple of miles to go, Sierra told Josh he could turn around and head back. She could do the last bit by herself just fine. It was a gorgeous, warm evening and still really light outside. Josh carried on alongside her for a few more minutes, but the ever-independent Sierra kept saying he should turn back and not worry about her. He finally agreed, they kissed and hugged goodbye, and Josh told her to text him when she got back. He stood and watched as she pedalled off into the distance along the cornfields. But the peace and calm would soon be shattered. Josh, at home and waiting for the message, started to get nervous as his phone remained silent. A few hours passed and he eventually called Sheila, but she was out at the time and assumed her daughter was either still with him or already at home. As the temperature dropped and the sun started to set, a wave of panic washed over everybody as they realised that all this time they had completely crossed wires. Sierra's phone was now going straight to voicemail. She had been wearing shorts, a neon-coloured tank top and her Fitbit, and her bike was a distinctive bright colour too. The problem was it was now really dark, and there were miles and miles of cornfields along the route she had been going down. A daunting search lay ahead. If she was lying somewhere in a field, potentially hurt or having been in an accident, would they even be able to spot her? After an hour of driving around and calling her name, it was time for the police to get involved. They needed helicopters and dogs for this kind of area. At 11pm, a missing persons report was filed, and by 3am, everybody was out looking for her. Shining their torches around vast, dark fields, where everything looked the same for as far as the eye could see, was seeming really hopeless. But then, suddenly, they saw the light bounce back at them. Something was reflecting. It was Sierra's bike. On the ground nearby, they found some odd items, none of which were Sierra's. Two pairs of sunglasses, a screwdriver and a small fuse box. They also saw some tracks that looked to have come from a motorcycle. There were broken corn stalks and some of the stalks had blood on them. There had clearly been a struggle and it looked as though Sierra had been forced off the road It was less than 500 feet from her home. They taped off everything coming in and out and the FBI were called in too. One of the agents said, 
It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. You just had this eerie feeling that you knew that this was an abduction site. Given the fact that she was last with Josh and the motorcycle tracks were found, he was the first person to speak to, but he was immediately ruled out as a person of interest. He had proof he was at home and was absolutely riddled with anxiety, worry and guilt about her doing the last bit by herself. Detectives started looking at her phone and Fitbit data instead, but there was really nothing to go off. A single ping from her phone pointed to a few miles from where her bike was found and there didn't appear to be anything there. Detectives said they now had to consider the scary possibility that maybe she had been snatched as part of a sex trafficking ring. Areas just outside of Metamora had been known for cases like this, with young women being abducted and later found as far out as Las Vegas, thousands of miles away. And the concern was, this was a rural and empty area, with miles and miles of country road, and not a single camera anywhere. If she had been abducted hours beforehand, she could be hundreds of miles away by now, with no technology to track her. As her family watched as the tape started to cover the roads, police said they couldn't tell them anything. They were keeping what they had found near her bike under wraps, so all her family could do was carry on making calls to Sierra's friends, classmates and the local hospital, praying that at some point someone would pick up and give them the answer they wanted. She was fine, her phone battery had simply died, and everything could all be easily explained. Police then got a call from one of the locals. On the night Sierra had gone missing... He had been driving with his son when he spotted a black motorcycle helmet in the road. He thought nothing of it, but threw it into the back of the truck. Now he wondered if it could be connected. A closer look showed there was blood on the helmet, and it was sent away for testing. It was now 48 hours into the search, and an increased reward of $100,000 was being offered for any information. Investigators were going door to door, which, in an area like this wasn't actually taking much time, due to the fact it was mainly farmhouses and not that many of them. They soon came across a dilapidated old property, with a couple of barns attached, sitting on an acre of land. It was home to 57-year-old James Worley, who ran a repair shop from there with his brother and, until recently, their late mother. James opened the door, and it was instantly obvious that this was an inconvenience for him, and he wasn't happy to stand around and chat. He was argumentative and abrasive. I know we just kind of showed up, so we... Well, yeah, you kind of showed up. <laughs> it's a bad reason that you're here, it obviously. It's, yeah. I do the best I can each day with what I got, with ain't much. But I'm not out there stealing chicks, robbing chicks, stealing people. They asked him where he was on the night Sierra went missing, and, to their surprise, he admitted to being in that exact area. He said his motorbike had broken down, and it just so happened to be where Sierra's bike was. He said he debated on using it to get home, but decided against it, and instead pushed his all the way back. He said on the way he dropped his helmet, his screwdriver and the fuse box, but he definitely hadn't seen Sierra anywhere in that area. One detective said it was such a wild story that he had to stop his jaw from falling open. None of the items they found at the scene had been made public up until this point either. One thing was for sure though, he had just placed himself right at the very spot, and no matter how hard he tried to spin his reasoning for being there, it just didn't make sense. But this wasn't enough for them to get a search or arrest warrant, so they had to leave. James's neighbours had little good to say about him. He had a very intimidating presence and made people feel uncomfortable. He always paid close attention to younger girls, and families did not like their children playing near his home. One neighbour said, You knew who he was and where he lived, but you didn't know anything about him. Just that something was strange. Back at the station, a background check on James gave them a good reason to get that search warrant. He had actually been released from prison in 1993 for abducting a cyclist called Robin Gardner, he was in his truck and forced her off the road about 20 miles from where Sierra had gone missing. He got out and acted like he was going to help her, but held a screwdriver to her throat and started dragging her into the truck, telling her he would kill her if she fought back. He hit her over the head and pulled handcuffs from his glove box. Unbelievably, she managed to jump out of the moving truck and was rescued by another driver. James was given a 10-year sentence, but he served just three years for this. 
this was too similar to what they believed had happened to Sierra, and he needed a revisit. Back at his house, they wanted to look around the barns. In the one furthest away from the house, they saw a green crate on the ground, which had been covered by stacks of hay bales. Inside the crate was bags and bags of women's underwear and clothing which he had labelled up. Some had blood on them. James started to visibly panic, telling them it was too hot inside and everyone needed to leave to get fresh air, but they weren't going anywhere. As they looked closer, the walls of the barn had bloodstains on them. They found handcuffs, zip ties, rolls of duct tape, rope, weapons and masks, more of which was later found in his truck. There were cameras hidden around the barn too, and a bloodstained mattress. A piece of plywood was stacked against the wall, and when they pulled it back, it was covering a hole in the ground. It was actually a freezer that had been buried in the ground. It was lined with a blood-stained carpet, and there was an intense smell of chemicals coming from inside it. This barn was, put simply, a torture chamber, a house of horrors. James's answer to all of this? At first he said the underwear and other things were probably left by an ex-girlfriend. Then he told them he was trying to set up a production company to shoot X-rated films, and this was his set. As the officers stared at him in disbelief, James blurted out, I've been around the block, would I leave any evidence whatsoever to be found? There wasn't a chance that any of what he said or what they found was going to fly, and detectives placed him in handcuffs. They definitely now had probable cause, and he was arrested on suspicion of the abduction of Sierra. In the main house, they found a letter he had written to his court-appointed therapist, saying he had learned a lesson from each abduction, and the next person he did it to, he would bury. A few miles from James's house, and just days after the search for Sierra had started, drones had picked up a mound of dirt in one of the cornfields. It looked like a freshly dug hole that had been covered over. Cadaver dogs reacted very quickly, and they just knew the search for Sierra Jargon had now come to a very sad end. She had been buried in a shallow grave, hogtied, with her wrists handcuffed and her ankles tied with rope and bound to her hands. She was wearing a diaper and had died of asphyxiation over several minutes after choking to death on a plastic gag, which was still inside her mouth. It had been forced in so hard, it broke a tooth. The medical examiner said there was no evidence that they could see of a sexual assault, but one thing was for certain. The sheer brutality and indignity of what had happened to her was so heartbreaking, and investigators had to take a moment to compose themselves. As the phone rang Sierra's family late that night, Sheila said they all took a breath before Sierra's dad answered. The silence that filled the room was deafening. Sheila described it as a deep, dark, quiet hole of despair that everyone was just frozen in. As the phone call ended, still no words were spoken, but it was a moment where nothing needed to be said. 20-year-old Sierra Joggin went missing Tuesday night during a bike ride. The Fulton County Sheriff says authorities located the body in an area around County Road 7 Friday night. Positive identification will be made through either fingerprints or DNA, but at this time, we strongly believe that this is Sierra. Local, state, and federal investigators searched the grounds and ponds in that area, including the nearby home and barn of the suspect, James Worley, who is currently charged with abduction. Their only suspect in her abduction and now murder had not changed. 57-year-old James Worley was fortunately still in custody. The all-important forensics were now coming back in, and as well as phone records placing James in the area that she went missing from at the time she did, the mattress in his barn, some rope, duct tape and the motorcycle helmet were all covered in both his and Sierra's DNA. His recent internet searches were of pornography, specifically searching the terms hitchhiker, helpless, gag, rape, and hogtied. James Worley was charged with 19 counts, 
including murder, abduction, tampering with evidence and abuse of a corpse. He was held without bail and pleaded not guilty to every single charge. The investigator's theory was this. Using his phone data, they could place him right near where she had been riding with Josh. They believed that he had followed her for a while after he saw them separate, pulled over on his motorbike and hit her over the head with his helmet. He dragged her into the cornfield, possibly threatening her with the screwdriver, the same as he had done with Robin, then tied her up. He then called his brother to get a lift back to the house to get his van, telling him there was something wrong with his bike. He then drove back in his van alone and took her back to the barn. What happened next is not really known, but we can all agree it does not bear thinking about. After nearly a year and a half of court hearings, this trial is almost here. January 16th is when it begins. Today was another pre-trial hearing. Right off the bat, the prosecution and her family were seeking the death penalty, and the amount of evidence they had against him was undoubtedly going to make for a very painful but very strong trial. His lawyers were trying to prove that someone else had been there, as there was some unknown DNA under Sierra's fingernails, and they said if someone else was involved, you couldn't say with certainty whether James was the killer or the accomplice. But this DNA could have come from literally anything, and the DNA found inside his barn was all the defence was focused on. His barn and what he did to Robin all those years ago told them everything they needed to know. They called numerous people to the stand, including Sheila, Josh and Robin, who had survived James's attack back in 1990, while James's team called only two people. Get in the truck or I'm going to kill you. The harrowing testimony of Robin Gardner, a woman abducted by James Worley in 1990. Gardner didn't want her face shown, but recounted the details of July 4th, 1990. Didn't fight, but I struggled to get away and begged to get away. Members of the Fulton County Sheriff's Office, along with investigators from the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, testified to finding a cornfield Sierra was abducted from, showing the jury blood-stained evidence they collected like Sierra's sock and bike. And images of how Sierra was found in that grave brought a BCI investigator to tears. Did she keep that straw in her hair? But while these items, along with a long list of pornographic movies found on Worley's computer, were entered into evidence, the defense painted a different picture of the defendant. Worley's longtime friend testified Worley was interested in starting up a porn studio to generate money. Okay, so he was going to run it as an LLC. Something, yeah. No. Something like that. Right. Run it as a business, not yeah. as a hobby. Yeah. His lawyers described him as a very damaged man with many mental health issues and implied at one point he had even had an incestuous relationship with his mother before her death. While the prosecution agreed he was undoubtedly a very sick individual, they said there was no evidence for the story about his mother being true. James's own sister testified and said that he was a suspect in at least three murders and missing persons cases too, although nothing was ever proven in these. One was the case of 14-year-old Laurie Ann Hill from the 80s, which had sadly since gone cold and Claudia Tinsley, who James admitted to being in a car with the very night she went missing. After six hours of back and forth, the jury reached their verdict. We, the jury, unanimously agreed the aggravating circumstances committed by the defendant outweigh the mitigating factors beyond a reasonable doubt, and hereby unanimously find the defendant should be sentenced to death. I will now need to uh, poll the jurors. James Worley was found guilty of murder, and a total of 17 of the 19 charges. They recommended the death penalty, but his lawyers were hoping for life in prison. They called a criminal psychologist who suggested the attack was motivated by sexual sadism connected with a fetish disorder and diagnosed him with sexual paraphilia disorder. During his sentencing, James went on a 40 minute long rant claiming he wasn't her killer and that he'd been framed. Your hearts are wounded. And they always will be. But if you believe like I, I believe that Sierra goes on. She may have been murdered and victimized, but she goes on. At one point he even said, don't ask me why she wasn't raped, she was a beautiful girl, but she wasn't and I'm glad. 
her poor family could listen to no more and left the courtroom. The aggravated murder of C.R. Jogren outweighs any and all mitigating factors beyond a reasonable doubt. The court therefore accepts the recommendation of the jury. The court orders that James D. Worley is hereby sentenced to death for the aggravated murder of C.R. Jogren. The court orders that the execution date of James D. Worley be set for June 3rd, 2019 to be carried out by the appropriate authorities. Uh, the court typically concludes this case by having a few comments. I have been told uh, by my brethren who handled these cases that that is inappropriate here. Uh, suffice it to say, Mr. Worley, I think you would have been well advised to listen to your attorneys before you made your statement. I thought your attorneys did an excellent job in handling your defense. And one further comment, Mr. Worley, if I thought there was a snowball's chance in hell that you were innocent, you'd be looking at life. Courts in recess. All right. The judge agreed with the jury's decision. James Worley was sentenced to death, and his execution date was set for 2019. But because he quickly appealed, this was pushed back. His appeal was, of course, denied, and he is now scheduled to be executed on May 20th, 2025. All right, this is going to not be easy, but I'll get through it. So uh, needless to say, this has been a long four weeks. Having to sit through the detailed testimony, piles of evidence, and the learning of what this killer, and past violent offender, which is really important to us, past violent offender, did to our beautiful Sierra, it was gut-wrenching. Our hope through this painful process was to find justice for Sierra. Justice for her abduction and murder, justice for our family, and justice for the amazing community that so many of us live in. I want to express to you how pleased we are that justice has been served today and this murderer was found guilty on all counts. In a wrongful death lawsuit, Sheila was granted James's property as well as $3.6 million. She said she knew she would probably never see a single cent of that, however his property was now hers, and this was far more important. She decided it needed to be torn down. I'm not going to lie, there is an emotional gratification in tearing down and burning something you loathe so much. We look forward to removing the darkness and opening it up and letting the light shine in, she said. She hopes the land can become something positive in Sierra's memory, rather than a reminder of what happened there. Police also continue to look at the surrounding area for anything else that could lead them to more information and possibly more victims of James. December 2018 witnessed the unanimous passing of Sierra's law. Ohio Senate Bill 231. The law established a database which is accessible to both law enforcement and members of the public and enables them to identify the presence of violent offenders in their neighbourhoods. It also allows police to interview potential suspects within the first 24 to 48 hours after a person is reported missing. By 2021, more than 2,000 offenders were registered in the database. And a question that still remains to this day was, did James have any other victims as well as Robin and Sierra? Police believe, yes, he did. They continue to look into his background, cold cases and any claims made against him. Robin said, I don't think anybody like him can go 26 years without doing what he did because you don't just do it and then suppress it and then do it again. For a logical, normal, sane person, that just doesn't make sense. I know his strength and anger. Authorities said you only had to look at his property to realise that place had been designed to kidnap, hold and assault multiple women without anybody hearing to find them. As well as huge changes in the law, Sierra's hometown remembers her and celebrates her life with every year that passes. A memorial plaque and tree sits at Sierra's old school, Evergreen High School, and they now offer a scholarship in her name too. Justice for Sierra was set up by her family and is a non-profit organisation which provides self-defence training courses for schools and educates the public on safety. Her boyfriend Josh also threw himself into campaigning and founded Keeping Our Girls Safe, which also gives classes and works with first responders. The community holds an annual 5k race in Sierra's name every year called Joggin' for Joggin'. 
and hundreds of riders will make the 40-mile drive for the Sierra Jargon Memorial Motorcycle Ride. The thought of what happened to Sierra and what she went through in her last moments is enough to make you feel as sick as it does sad. The pain is excruciating and the depth of emptiness we feel is unexplainable, Sierra's Aunt Tara said. However, I want him to know this. It may seem that he has broken us, but we as a family are stronger than he thinks, and because we were lucky enough to have had Sierra's love, we are unbreakable. Sheila said of her daughter, Sierra's life was worth far more than the 20 years she was able to live. She inspired people she did not know, and I can only wonder what great things she would have accomplished if she was still alive. But in her death, I know she's moving mountains. If you'd like to support our channel and help us to continue to make content, please don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. It helps us so much and we really appreciate it.